it is time to get this party started and that party is the CompTIA IT Fundamentals exam prep. That's what we are looking at today. So basically what we're going to talk about today is the common cloud computing devices. So not cloud computing, just common computing devices. And this sometimes includes things that you know, talk to the cloud or talk to the internet, but we're going to learn the very basics. Again, the IT fundamentals exam is meant to be the starting point on your IT career. So if you've done things with computers in the past, this could be review for you. So I, I promise just stick with me. There will be things that are that are going to challenge you. The great thing about the IT fundamentals exam is it goes into all aspects of technology. So there's going to be some programming, there's going to be some database stuff, uh, there's some server stuff, networking. It's kind of an all encompassing IT, you know, I, well, there's not a better name for it, IT fundamentals. It's all the fundamental things that you need to be successful in a career in IT. So uh, moving forward, what are our objectives for this specific module? So there's, there's five parts to the first module or section, if you will. Uh, and this is the first one. So this is, uh, I guess we'll call it unit one, maybe, or the first module, however you want to however you want to organize it. But we're going to describe the basics of how a computer processes data. So from us, you know, typing on the keyboard to things actually happening on the computer, you know, what is that actual process? Because if you understand this fundamental process, of how computers work. It's going to make your life a lot easier when you're troubleshooting issues. And then finally, we want to talk about different devices. So what makes a server a server? And if you've never heard that word, we're going to learn what a server even is and how it's different than just a regular PC or a regular workstation. We're going to talk about IoT or Internet of Things. And we're going to talk about mobile devices because at the end of the day, all of these things are computers in some way, shape, or form. They are going to take inputs and then something's going to happen. So first off, let's talk a little bit about information technology. So with IT, it's a system to process, store, and transfer information. Okay, so IT systems, they go through and process data. So from a user, you know, entering stuff on their keyboard to it being saved on a server, whether that's locally or up in the cloud, those are going to be the, you know, all aspects of IT. So when someone says, I work in IT, well, chances are they work in a field in which there's many computers or many devices in which they help manage. So that could be a mobile device, that could be a door entry system, a camera system. We're responsible, as IT professionals, we're responsible for pretty much anything that has a chip in it, which is a good thing. I mean, it's job security. That means, you know, as this new technology comes out, we're going to be hired to manage those things. Another thing too, you know, where we're looking as a society where everything is going right now is a big focus on data and data for advertising, data for things like COVID-19, data for, you know, how students learn. You know, there's constantly data collection and that data is then, you know, chomped on, if you will, and, you know, computers think about it and then spit out results so that way we can improve as a society. So because of that, you know, being in IT right now, you just, it's, everywhere you look, there's a, some type of job for IT. Even here where, you know, where I'm being, where this is being taught from in Ashland, Ohio, um, I got a notification yesterday that kind of a basic break fix technician, there was a job available for 35 to $38 an hour. So $70,000 because people just can't find enough IT professionals. So that's why I believe this is one of the best industries to get into because there's so many aspects of it. But because we're in the information age, data processing is super, super critical. There's not really any career that isn't going to have some type of data or computer involved with it. Um, everything from your, you know, your local vet to even manufacturing. You know, we have a class here at the Career Center that's Ramtech, and a lot of that is computer based or computer aided when it comes to, you know, figuring out schematics and, you know, they build robots there to build stuff, you know, so even that has some aspects of technology involved with it. So if we look at the bare basics, there's two big points that you need to understand and that is hardware and that's stuff that you can touch you know the hardware is you know physical things like keyboards mice to hard drives and memory and cpus where software is going to be the stuff that we interact with as users so that's the 
you know, obviously the operating system, you might have heard of Windows 7, Windows 10, now Windows 11, um, or different applications like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Photoshop, uh, Google Chrome, those are all different applications. So that's gonna be more of your software because you don't really touch the software. So when these two things com combine, that's when you have an actual computer system. So if we're looking at it from another aspect, you know, that's a computer, but your phone is the same way. You have applications on your phone, right? You have Facebook, you have um, Snapchat, you have a Chrome or a web browser of some sort. And the hardware is the physical phone itself or any peripherals kind of that you plug into it. So, and if you've never heard that term, a peripheral is a device that is connected. So a mouse would be a peripheral for a computer. Headphones would be a peripheral for a, um, mobile device or your phone. Um, what else? I mean, if you're at the grocery store, you know, the scanner that scans the UPCs, that is a peripheral to the actual uh, point of sale system. So if it's attached to it, that is a peripheral or something that is used to aid in the, you know, the basic system process. And we'll get into how computers process data here in a minute. Um, and finally, just user interfaces. So user interfaces can be both physical and digital because an interface, you know, we interface with a keyboard. So how it's laid out, a, a user can either like or dislike, right? Same thing with the actual operating system itself. You know, how big the icons are on the screen on your phone compared to where things are located in control panel on a computer. You know, so user interface is very important. So that's the kind of, if we were to draw a Venn diagram, user interfaces would kind of be in the middle of that uh, because it's both software and hardware. So I hope that makes sense. You know, user interfaces can be both physical and digital. So when we talk about the basics of computing or processing, the first thing that we have is the input. And that is when the user types something in. That could be just as simple as a letter, and then the computer processes that input, and then that letter shows up on a screen in a Google Doc. Okay, that would be the very, you know, the very bare basics. And a lot is going on behind the scenes in order for that to happen. So when you hit that key, it is then converted into just basic instructions that the computer or the CPU will then process, okay? So it goes from what you entered in, it'll stop off and hang out at the memory, and then when that computer processor is ready to process it, it'll pull it from the RAM and it'll process that data. And we haven't got into all the parts of the computer yet, um, but CPU is what processes all the different calculations very quickly on the computer but just like a you know if you're in line at say burger king or you know starbucks you have to wait in that line right well that line exists in ram okay and ram is very fast uh, but it's a temporary storage meaning if the power goes out then that line falls apart just like if the power went out at mcdonald's that line's probably going to clear out pretty quick because they can't cook food they can't take money so the RAM is a temporary place for those instructions to be stored. So after that, the CPU, it'll say, hey, I'm ready for you, next car, move on up, keep going here. And as that car pulls up or as that set of instructions pulls up, the CPU will then process that order. So after it's done, after it processes that order, it has to hand it out the window, right? It has to leave McDonald's into your vehicle. So then it's gonna, result, it's gonna take that meal and put it back into the line or back into that car so that way it can do other actions, okay? So again, car pulls up, gets stored in memory, hey, we're not ready for you yet, okay? I'm ready to complete your order, and then it hands it back. And then whatever the instructions are, those, you know, it kind of determines its next path. Another thing that we're gonna talk about, we're gonna do a whole module on it, but the fact is the CPU really only deals with ones and zeros or on and off, okay? So the data that is stored in that RAM, those instructions are first converted into something that, you know, those set of instructions is in ones and zeros. So again, this is a lot of big picture things, but the key takeaway here is digital data is binary and almost everything we do in computing comes back to those ones and zeros, okay? So let's break that down even further. So we talked about, you know, how it, you know, a user puts something in and then there was the McDonald's thing. Let's break it down even further. 
So the first thing is input. How does this computer, how does the CPU, how, how do you even get in line, if you will? Well, the first thing is input. So input comes from your peripheral devices. So this is gonna be your keyboard, mouse, touch screen. Um, it could be a microphone, like right now I'm recording into a microphone, so that is an input. And then from there, the CPU or the memory is gonna get those instructions, and then the CPU is going to manage or process those things and then ship it back out. So from there, the actual output is gonna show up on a peripheral device such as a monitor, or it could be you know, audio. You know, It goes out of the system somehow. So input, process, output, okay? And then if it has to stay around for a while, let's say we're doing, uh, we're working on a paper for English class. You know, we do our input means we type in the um, letters. Those letters are then processed by the CPU and the output is the screen because they show up on the screen, right? Well, as soon as we hit file save, that's when we go into storage and that's where the actual data is stored on the system. And storage or hard disk in this case is different than memory and a lot of people get these things confused. So what you have to remember is memory, when the power goes out, it loses all of its data. It's called it's what's called volatile, meaning it's going to disappear. If it doesn't have an electronic charge, it cannot hold on to that. Where storage is actually like etched into the uh, yeah, etched into a platter, if you will. Okay, and it's done via magnets, but it's actually written into stone. So when that computer comes back up, that data is still going to be on the hard drive itself. And that would be what's called persistence. It's gonna be there, it's gonna persist. Just like if you've ever had you know, a younger brother or sister or a niece and nephew and they want something, they just keep persisting. They're not gonna give up, right? It's the same thing here. Hard drives, you know, they're, the data is gonna be there even if the power gets reset. And then the other thing that's out there is network. So with networks, let's say the data doesn't get stored here locally. So let's say we're working on a Google Doc, then that data you know, is transferred via the network in order to save it elsewhere. It doesn't get saved on a server here or on your hard drive here. It's up in the cloud itself. So let's take a little bit, and there's a whole, in the module, there's actually a video on computer history. So we're not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but back in the day, we had what are called mainframe computers, and they were huge, okay? I mean, they would take up whole rooms, and you know, you'll actually see you know, video clips and stuff if you look at the, uh, other videos in this module, they took up whole, you know, whole floors of buildings back in the day and they would do very simple tasks. They would, you know, do very simple computing and that could be tabulating like for the census, for example, they would have just one job and you would feed them this job via punch cards and it would do all this processing. Well, in the 1980s, we figured out a way to get these huge vacuum tube powered behemoths down to a very, very small size. And not small size like you're thinking today. I mean, we have Raspberry Pis and stuff today that are really, really small and tiny phones and, you know, not that small, but desktop size, you know, full size desktop size. And this was the revolution of the 1980s because now we had, we made the computer that was, you know, you normally have to go visit at a university somewhere. It was now personal and you could have it at home and it allowed you to do more than one task, meaning you could do word processing or you could go and you know interact with a modem with other people. And that was all done from your home. So it really democratized the idea of computing or being able to use a computer because now, I mean, they were expensive, so it wasn't like they were super you know, affordable and everybody could have one, but more people could have them, which means more people could work on software development and build applications and you know, really grow this idea of having a computer in the home. And back in the day, it was the I IBM was one of the leaders, um, Steve Jobs and Steve um, Wozniak you know, were on the Apple side of the house, Bill Gates on the Windows side of the house where he was really focused on the operating system, uh, which was known as Windows, you know, that's where they kind of got their start. You know, they were in college at that time and they were part of that revolution of seeing that we could now create, have these microprocessors or a computer on a chip. And now they were, you know, they were the pioneers that really changed, you know, into the computers that we even see today. Now, fast forward 10 years, 
that was in the 90s and that's where we saw the boom of the internet and different internet websites as more and more people got connected um, more lines were you know ran that's when AOL was big you know America online um, and that's you know and that's still today I mean the internet is more and more things are you know online we really don't have many servers even located on premises anymore either because it's all cloud-based well that all started back in the 1990s and that's when we started seeing laptops we started seeing you know the first smartphones I remember um, in the early 2000s I got my first smartphone and you know it started off as a Palm Pilot and then they were able to add phone technology to it and then they added a web browser and then it just spiraled until um, Steve Jobs in I believe 2007 uh, released the iPhone that we see today which was a touch device it was color it had a web browser it had um, you know basic you know kind of the second one had 3G capability so it was a little bit faster and then it took off from there and then the final thing here is IOT or Internet of Things and the idea is there is just like we took microprocessors in the 80s and made computers you know kind of democratize that we're doing the same thing but with smart devices so now we have smart speakers that you know like Alexa or Google Homes uh, you have lights that turn on and off those are all connected to the internet directly and it's the same thing with if we went back to the last slide about that input but the input is now our device so or our voice so we would say hey Google turn on the lights well then that goes out to the internet and then the cloud controller then sends that command to the peripheral which is like a light to go on and off so things like that when we're putting you know we're connecting cars we're connecting our fridges we're connecting our lights those are all IOT devices and that is the Internet of Things so when it comes to desktops there's a couple things to you know take in mind or keep in mind and why you would want to buy a you know desktop versus a laptop well number one they're easy to upgrade because you have more room and again I'm speaking from a general build a full-size desktop as you get into computers you'll realize there are different case sizes so there's ATX micro ATX ITX and those are all different form factors for that computer case but generally speaking um, you can update or upgrade memory you can put a bigger hard drive or maybe even a second hard drive on there um, you could do um, get a bigger monitor maybe get a second monitor those are all things that are harder to do on a laptop but what are some of the reasons to not get a workstation well what if you have to work from home or what if you have to work remotely well a desktop is not really going to be you know if you're going back and forth from the office it's not really going to be a good solution you know that's where a laptop is going to be a little bit better um, and then there's also this idea of an all-in-one so you see on the illustration here this is your traditional computer well with an all-in-one the speakers the CPU that's all built into the what looks like the monitor uh, so it's a little bit cleaner sleeker look um, things like the iMac if you want to Google anything Google the iMac um, from Apple that in my opinion is one of the most beautiful all-in-ones uh, or the Surface Pro I believe it's called the Surface Pro the desktop surface um, is also a beautiful computing device and it's an all-in-one as well it just means everything is packed into like the monitor so servers and this is kind of a I don't usually like definitions with the you know the word in it but it's it's hard to explain any other way but a server is any computing device that is providing services or serving up things so think of it like if you were to serve dinner you know you're gonna walk around and people are gonna pull food off the plate right I mean you're serving it to them or you're putting that in front of them it's the same same thing here um, and the reason it says any computer is because you can have this be your phone for example um, I'll flash back to circa 2010 between 2010 and 2012 um, I actually went to Cuba to train and there was not really an easy way to disperse different PDFs and files that were needed so on my iPad I turned on a web server and then they were able to connect their devices via a web browser and pull down all of those files so I didn't bring a server a specialized device with me to Cuba with me I just used my device in order to serve up these files so 
when we get into pen testing or penetration testing, we're actually going to do this similar thing because we're going to fire up a Python web server and say a directory in order to pull files off of there. Because when we're doing penetration tests, it's all about the loot that we find. Uh, so we're going to fire up this little web server and a folder and we're going to pull that data off. So you don't have to have a specialized device in order to be considered a server. That being said, if you are if this has to be a dedicated resource, for example, you need to serve up files all year round, then you should buy a specific server because you have better hardware, more durable hardware. So it's just like buying a car. You know, if you are just looking for a car to get from you know point A to point B, and you're looking for let's say gas mileage, then Toyota Camry will work great. But what if you have a construction business and you have to pull trailers? Well, that that Toyota cameras, Camry is probably not going to do as well, right? You probably want a larger truck that is more durable, that has more power, that has more capabilities for your specific use. Because again, you're doing construction and you need to pull heavy equipment around. So it's the same thing with server class hardware. You're going to have redundancy, which means you're going to have more than one hard drive in that. You're going to have more than one network card to connect to the internet because if one fails, again, its job is to provide services. So if it cannot provide services, then it's not doing its job and users get really mad when they can't access their files or they can't get online. So that's where you get into what's called redundancy or fault tolerance. So redundant, you know, it. I think you know what redundant means is it's the same thing. So we have two hard drives, we have, you know, multiple memory, you have sometimes you have multiple servers that are load balancing, and they're doing the same thing. But if one goes down, there's a whole nother one that can kind of pick up that load. And fault tolerance means if something happens, then nothing will die or the users won't notice something, you know, awry, or they're not going to lose out on their services. Another thing is the form factor of an actual server is going to be rack mountable. So what does that mean? What does rack mountable mean? Well, you saw on the last slide, a desktop sits uh, on your desk, hence the name desktop. Uh, whereas a server, you're going to have multiple computers in one big tower, if you will, and they're going to go in and they're going to be, you know, from top to bottom, you're going to have multiple computers. and that form factor tends to be a little bit longer or deeper uh, because they're only, and we'll talk about it, it's they're different unit sizes or U's. So you'll have like a 2U or a 3U or a 4U, and that is the standard that is, you know, been adopted is this idea of units in an actual rack itself. So with that, a server is going to have, you know, you're, if you buy a server, it's going to probably be rack mountable. You're going to have multiple hard drives. You're going to have fault tolerance, so that way users don't, you know, notice anything going down. So now, laptops, on the other hand, laptops are going to be more mobile because, again, you need to be work from everywhere, and laptops even includes Chromebooks in this case. Um, with that, they're all self-contained, meaning you have the keyboard, the mouse the speakers, the headphone jack, all, all that is all built into one device. And it has a screen right on it. Sometimes that's a touch screen as well, so it can kind of become a tablet. Uh, you would buy this for you know size and weight. If you want something that's more portable, if you have to be on the go, maybe you're working from a vehicle or public transit, that would be why you would want a um, laptop. And Laptops now have become kind of become the standard because you can get things like docking stations. So when you're at home, you just pop it in this docking station and then you have your big monitor, your full size keyboard, mouse, that kind of stuff. So a couple other terms that it's important to know is an OEM. So an OEM is the original equipment manufacturer. So that's going to be like your Dell, your HP. It could even be your local computer, um, not your local computer shop, but they are going to um, well, I guess they could be because they're gonna they're gonna assemble it. So yeah, they would be an, an OEM. They're gonna pull parts from other OEMs to build their computer. But the big ones are um, for laptops and desktops are gonna be your Dell, your HPs, Lenovo, Acer, um, Apple. They're all gonna be your OEMs. Now on laptops and stuff, that's gonna be more like Samsung, Sony, Toshiba, Asus. Uh, they don't really get into the um, 
the PC game as much. Um, back in the day they did, but you don't really see that very often. Um, Apple, you know, we know Apple does iPhones, but they also do laptops, desktops, they do iPads or tablets. Uh, you have Chromebooks, which are made by um, pretty much all the brands, um, except for Apple. And then on the server side, server side it's really um, Dell, HP, and Lenovo. Those are gonna be your OEMs in that case. So smartphones and tablets, or now we have kind of the in-between of a phablet. Uh, that's what I'm rocking the uh, Surface Duo right now, which is a phone, but then it has two screens, so it's like the size of a tablet. Um, like I said earlier, it started off from the PDA or a uh, personal digital assistant, also known as a Palm Pilot. Um, from there, they got more features, they got color screens, and they became kind of the devices that we see today. Uh, they have what's called solid state storage, so that's like a memory card that you would put in a um, camera. That's solid state. And what solid state means, it doesn't have any spinning disks. Traditional hard drives are like a record player in that you know, the disk spins around and a needle writes data to it. Well, that would that'd be really horrible for a phone, right? We're always on the move with our phones. People are always dropping their phones. And with a hard drive, if just think about it, if you had a needle going over a record player, if you know what a record player is, or a CD, and something happened, it would get scratched, right? And it would damage it. So that's where you know this idea of solid state storage has really grown over the last decade is because you don't have to worry about dropping it. Um, you also, there's no moving parts at all. So it's a lot quicker to get data in and off. Um, but yes, phones have solid state drives or solid state uh, storage on them. Uh, there's different formats. So, oh, they actually have Fablet on here. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, but you have the smartphone, which is the 4.5 to 5.7. What would be considered a phablet is five to seven inches. From there, you have tablet, which is seven to 10 inches. And then sometimes you'll have um, laptops that have LTE or a cellular modem built in. Um, and that would be more of your hybrids. IOT, we talked about this a little bit. Um, that's where home automation comes in. And what home automation is, is when you can control your home or automate things or you know create a recipe, if you will, and stuff just happens. So I could say, you know, at five o'clock, I want all the lights to come in on my house, or I want to set my temperature in my house to a certain thing. That's where we would use these IOT devices in order to uh, make that happen. And you have devices that will talk directly to the internet and you don't have to have a device in your home to control them. Or there's other technologies that have a hub that sits like by your wireless router and that's gonna be your Z-Wave and your Zigbee. And they all connect to the hub and then the hub connects to the internet for you. And there, there's pros and cons to each of them. Um, it's really just however the manufacturers set up their, pro their um, set up their devices. Um, cameras are another thing, you know, security systems, they're gonna be cloud-based, so things like the Ring and the Nest Cam, those are gonna be internet connected, and then you access via an app um, on your device in order to see those things. Uh, you're also seeing more IoT happen with um, medical, on the medical side, uh, specifically to, you know, with COVID now, we had to figure out other ways to treat those patients. So uh, my wife was saying the other day that even sleep studies now are being done at home remotely and you sleep in your own bed. They're actually getting better data because you're in your own bed. And those sensors that are there are just sending that information through the cloud back to the actual physician. And there's multiple, you know, other examples of that, but that's the one that's you know, obviously fresh in my head. So gaming consoles, gaming consoles are gonna have the same components as an actual PC. You're gonna have the processor, you're gonna have a graphics processor, you're gonna have memory, you're gonna have storage. So they're just a different form factor and they're a very specific device. Just like servers were specific devices for you know, serving things up, gaming devices are specific to just being able to process gaming. I mean, there's been other projects that they've you know put Linux on a PlayStation and stuff like that, but primarily, it is made to you know just play games, and that's going to be your Sony, Xbox, and Switches of the worlds, um, and then you know portables. You have um, really just the Nintendo Switch. Uh, the PS Vita sadly is dying if it hasn't died already, um, but those are going to be your more mobile devices. And you know these all, no matter what, if you understand the basics, which is the input, the processing, the storage. Um, the display and then the storage, you're gonna be able to troubleshoot these other devices as well. So just to review, what we talked about was just the basics of how a computer processes data, you know, that input, 
process, display, storage, that's the basics of how a computer works. And again, over the next few modules, we're gonna really dig deep into you know hardware and stuff like that. But it's important just to have a big picture idea of how this stuff is supposed to work. We also talked about different things such as you know PC servers, mobile devices. We talked about IoT and home automation and how all of these things kind of come together for you know basic data processing.